we traced back some of the origins through a rather narrow channel, particularly in the hundred years that occurred in Northwest Europe and in particular in Britain, whereby the Industrial Revolution occurred. But in pursuing that, it became obvious that one couldn't understand that unless one looked at some of the wider links. Europe was linked with the New World and with Asia. And so much of what we're interested in came from trade, shipping, new knowledge from other parts of the world. So I wonder whether by going out to 250 years rather than 100 years and broadening our perspective to look at not only the old world of Europe but also America a little bit and also Islam, whether we won't get further with our quest. So one of the things that came out of the earlier discussion was the importance of ships and trading and empire and control of raw goods. And this happened all over the world, but one example might be the d explorations and discoveries in America. And I wonder, Joel, you have been to that part of the world, in fact lived there, and you've also been to the Hudson River. What did you discover when you went there? Well, uh, we sailed on a replica of Henry Hudson's ship known as the Halver Man or the Half Moon. Uh, we, and the original, of course, sailed up the river that's named after him, all the way up to what is now today Albany, New York. And um, in some sense, this voyage by Hudson sim uh, uh, symbolizes two very important features in uh, European economic history, which I'd like to draw out. Uh, one of them is that what is Henry Hudson looking for? When he's, when he's sailing up the Hudson. He's not there to explore a river. He doesn't know it's a river. He is looking for what is known as the Northwest Passage. The Northwest Passage is an attempt by Europeans to sail to the east, that is to say, to sail to China and to India, where there were all these commodities that they wanted, without having to circumnavigate Africa. Now, it couldn't be done. But they didn't know that. Mm. Columbus and was the first to fail at that. Of Columbus course, was the, the first to fail at that. But Columbus just found out that there was a continent blocking him somewhere in the middle of America, in the South America. But possibly, they thought, maybe we can go around it the northern way. Mm. And so eventually, he discovered what is today known as the Hudson Bay, which doesn't work either because it doesn't take you to the Pacific. But when he was sailing up the, what is today the east coast of the United States, he discovered this very broad river near an island known today as Manhattan. And he thought, well, if I sailed up this waterway, maybe it will take me across what turned out to be a very broad continent, not known to him, and I can find my way uh, to the Indies. Uh, well, it didn't work, but in the process, of course, Hudson and other people like him ended up discovering uh, North America. Europeans wanted to go to the East because they wanted to trade, and they wanted to trade because trade meant money. Um, but not only did they want to, to trade, they wanted to trade at the lowest possible cost. And of course, the trip around Africa, which took something like two years, and then two years to get back, was extremely expensive. So they are looking for shortcuts. And I think this is one of the elements that does set off Europeans uh, already uh, at this time. Not only that they want to produce, they want to produce efficiently. They want to cut costs. They want to do things, uh, as economists say, to sort of minimize them. Uh, that's one element I wanted to point out. The other element I wanted to point out is kind of interesting. Notice that the ship has a Dutch name. Mm. It is, in fact, a ship that's chartered in the Netherlands, and yet its captain is English. Uh, the reason he went to the Dutch is because the British uh, wouldn't pay for, his, for, his, for that trip. And as this is, of course, a story we know, because in some sense Columbus and other explorers did very much the same things. They shopped around. Mm. You can do that in Europe, because mm. in Europe there are a considerable number of uh, political entities in competition with each other. In 1609, the Dutch and the, and the English are in competition with each other in the same way that in 1492, the Spanish and the Portuguese are in competition mm. with each other. So if you are an explorer, or for that matter, an inventor, or somebody with a new idea, and you're trying to sell it 
to King A, and King A says, I'm not interested, you say, all right, I'll go to King B, and if mm. King B doesn't take it, it'll be <laughs> King C. This is what is known in Europe as the state system, and in some sense, this is one of the things that are different in Europe than they are, for instance, in China, oh, whereas the Chinese emperor says to Cheng Ho, you yes. will no longer yes. sail, the game yes. is up. Which he did in, 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 the, in the 15th century, Indeed. after great voyages that had been done all the way from China to Indeed. the east coast of Africa. Indeed. And, and there's they, nowhere else that Zheng He could go after that to Indeed. get anyone to support him. And if the imperial court is no longer interested, interested mm. the voyages cease. In Europe, because no single ruler ever managed to unite all of Europe in, in one system, this could not happen. If the King of France decided that he couldn't afford voyages of discovery or uh, wasn't interested, they just went somewhere else. And nobody had any qualms about it, nobody had any pangs of conscience of it. Loyalty to your country was definitely secondary to the need to carry out these voyages. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, this underlies one of the secrets of Europe. The competition of the state system within Europe meant that nobody could afford to fall very much behind. If you did, and it sometimes happened, you just disappeared off the political map. And in some sense, this is what happens to Spain and Portugal uh, at some point mm -hmm. in the middle of the 17th century. Mm -hmm. They stopped playing the game, and so the Dutch and the French and the English take it over. Mm -hmm. but I would venture that if it had happened that some very powerful ruler had managed to really effectively uh, unite Europe under one uh, government, and then the son or the grandson of that ruler had said, I really don't want anybody to make any waves, I like things the way they are, uh, let's honor our traditions, perhaps innovativeness in Europe would have stopped and we would have never had an industrial revolution. That never occurs in Europe, and I think, in some sense, this is a good thing. So, this is, of course, the fact that the Europeans ended up, uh, for a great number of years, fighting each other and throwing things like that at each other, um, because they had a state system, and these independent states a were cannonball. very... What? Nice, nice heavy this cannonball. is a cannonball, and this is very heavy, and if a thing like this falls on your head, <laughs> uh, you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> these wars of Europe, that these independent states fought with each other were extremely expensive economically. So entire areas of the country, one thinks of the south of Germany, one thinks of what is today Belgium, cities like Antwerpen and so on, which were Whose, whose economic uh, uh, performance was entirely wiped out by military operations. And so clearly the state system was a very expensive way of achieving progress. On the other hand, some areas of the world which were unified and therefore reasonably peaceful uh, also didn't have, I think, enough internal competition to keep the dynamism flowing. And so the net result is that Europeans were able to forge ahead, but at a tremendous cost, both in human terms and in economic terms. And in many ways, England was in this, Britain was in this privileged position of being part of a state system with all the benefits of competition and active neighbors, but less of the flip side, because having 20 miles of ocean between itself and these warring neighbors less of these things came its direction. It could fire them outwards through its navy and its assaults on its neighbors, but its neighbors never actually managed to get a, get no, a foothold. Absolutely. There are great advantages of being an island, and of course the Japanese mm. enjoyed the same advantage. It doesn't work for all islands, one should mention. For instance, being an island never did seem to have done much for the Irish. And probably the moral is that if you're going to be an island, make sure that there isn't a larger <laughs> island right island, next to you. Yeah. <laughs> and also the Japanese were, unfortunately for them, perhaps a bit too far away yes. from their particular continent. Yeah. It's not the sort of, there are no channel swimmers passing from Japan to the continent of East Asia. 20 miles is about, seems to be right, about right. But you mentioned the, turning to the, to the half-men, or however you pronounce this Dutch ship, and the Dutch connection. I mean, if you had looked at the world in about the time that Hudson sailed in 1609 and wondered where, if you had been thinking it futuristically about an industrial revolution, I think one of the places you might have thought, this is the place where it's going to occur, is in Holland. 
because it's so active, uh, so successful, it has a huge navy, and so on. So I wondered, um, Maxine, whether what, what were the great advantages of Holland as a place where such a, an occurrence might have occurred, what the plus point, so to speak, of Holland? I mean, Holland in the 17th century was, I mean, it was amazingly um, precocious I mean, if we're looking backward mm. on an economy. This is an economy that had um, a really high urban population, much, much higher um, urbanization there than anywhere else in Europe. And it was, um, uh, it, this was one of the British, the English achieve, the British achievements as well, but that comes a little bit later in the 18th century, but it was already there in place in Holland in the 17th century. And the Dutch, I mean, the, the Dutch were also a mercantile nation. They had these great long distance um, this long distance trade, um, well established control of the spice trade um, in the 17th century. They were trading to China, bringing back um, porcelain and silk and later tea. Um, and there's this, you know, enormous um, trade through the, through the Indies. This trade had to be financed, and they were also very successful in establishing the kinds of financial institutions. Um, to allow this long distance trade to take place, to finance voyages that lasted between two and four years. And, um, and to have this, to, to establish this, they had to uh, set up financial institutions and um, uh, means of credit such as bills of exchange and, and more long term credit arrangements. Um, and those became, um, they, they had of course um, in, been used in European trade um, before this, but this was really on a large, much larger scale and over much longer periods and for much, for long distance trade. And where sort of systems of trust had to be much, much, um, uh, much more firmly um, established because you're, this is sort of trade across vast, um, oh, vast oceans and if things could go wrong, ships... So to add one thing to, to what uh, Maxine said about the Dutch, and that is that you could argue, if you want, that between 1550 and 1650, they had something of a mini industrial revolution because uh, it often gets overlooked how much of the Dutch success story is actually based on technological advances and that this isn't just a society that's very good in buying and selling as their reputation was a little bit mm -hmm. and not even a, so a society that's very good in, in growing food. They had a very productive agriculture in addition to everything else. But it is also a society that is quite innovative and a large number of new products and new techniques emanate from, from Holland mm -hmm. uh, during its golden age. For instance, the most advanced paper uh, uh, making machine in the 18th century is known as the Hollander, okay? Mm -hmm. But in shipbuilding, for instance, they are the ones that build the most efficient, cheapest mer merchant ship known as the flagship, uh, which is not much to look at, but actually in terms of its uh, cost per shipping cargo for a, you know, per mile, is by far the most efficient way of moving commodities uh, across the ocean. And there's a large number of Dutch inventors who come up with really brilliant ideas. You know, people like Cornelius Dreddels and Simon Steven and people like that who actually are the big inventors of their time. Uh, what The reason that the Netherlands does not become the uh, birthplace of the Industrial Revolution is that this is a little bit too early. These techniques are to a large extent still extensions of medieval and renaissance technology. There are no real major breakthroughs. There isn't anything as radical as a steam engine that is coming out. Instead, they are improvements of existing techniques. They are important improvements in the sense of cost saving, in the sense of better products, but they are not great leaps forward uh, of the type that will make a railroad possible, uh, um, or say things like 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 make breakthroughs in, in chemical engineering. They they're not of that type. But for the time, it is there's no question that by say 1650, mm -hmm. Netherlands is where the action is at that time. I think it's after 1650, it, they have to share it with, with increasingly with other countries as well. 
But a, a lot of them were export processing um, innovations too, were they not? And so, in a sense, um, closely tied to the ports. Yes. And that was uh, it led to a, a, a lot of achievement, um, sugar refining processes, yeah, breweries, and, things like uh, that, copper processing, yeah. um, etc. But it was extending that outward to the rest of the economy um, that it hadn't. There yes. were more limitations on that. Yes, and then the fact that they were they were pretty good at really using what they had. Mm -hmm. So the Netherlands, for instance, does not have very rapidly flowing water, right? Which is what you expect since the country is as flat mm -hmm. as a pancake. So you're not going to have fast flowing rivers. So we they, they use windmills and there'll be yes. a lot of wind. Mm -hmm. But for instance, the country doesn't have any coal, mm -hmm. and you'd think that is a big obstacle. But in fact. It wasn't because what they did have is peat, yes. and they used peat very heavily in many of their industrial processes. Now, peat doesn't quite give you as much heat as, as coal does, but if it's very cheap, it serves mm -hmm. as a good substitute, and that's what they used. Um, they have, given that they have uh, built very good ships, they have a fishing industry. And they built the best herring buses. And they built the best herring buses, and they learn how to process the herring, and they're selling herring all over. And, and so they are very quick at exploiting mm -hmm. opportunities to make money wherever they occur. Mm -hmm. Some of those are commercial, mm -hmm. some of them are financial speculation, mm -hmm. but many of those are simply technological. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, there is no question that they were at the cutting edge mm -hmm. of uh, Europe's economic progress uh, uh, at the age. The real big question is why couldn't they sustain that momentum into the next stage? There are various theories about that, um, as you know as well as I do. One is you've already partly dismissed, but I don't think it can entirely be dismissed, which is coal. I mean, coal is about three times as efficient yes. as peat, and you can do the medieval technologies with peat, but uh, iron smelting and so on is very difficult with. Uh, glass and so on. So there's certain things you can get to a certain level, but beyond that you need coal. That is only one of the many factors. Another is this point we've made about land-based systems. I mean, Holland can be regarded in some ways as an island, but the, in this case it's not too far, as in the case of Japan, it's too close. Mm -hmm. And the constant threat, particularly yes. with the rising power of France, that you're going to be invaded, they repulse them. But there's a constant drain on the economy of having a land border like that. Uh, another factor, obviously, is um, the size. Yes. It's just a bit small. There isn't much of a hinterland. There's not much of an area in which you could have diversity and development. England is probably just about big enough. Holland is a bit small. Because labor. Labor is another very well, important Well, labor thing. was very expensive. It was big, big, partly because this was a, this was a, a major mercantile mm. empire. And we have to think what that cost in labor power. How many of those um, young men mm -hmm. going out on those ships mm. ever returned? Mm. Uh, mm. High proportions so, of the yes. Dutch labor force was, lo were, yes. was lost in sustaining this. And what mm. is the population growth? Mm. Is it? Mm. rising at the rate that Britain's is rising no. in the 18th century. No, you wouldn't expect it in an urban society, would you? Would you? Because their mortality rates are in, in the cities yes, are, 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 are yes. quite high, and in yes. fact, uh, during, mm. during the entire 17th and early 18th century, the Netherlands is a net recipient of immigrants, most mm. of them from Germany, yes. but also from, from, from the southern Netherlands, mm. what is today Belgium. And uh, I think there's one other factor that we shouldn't overlook, and that is, in some sense, there is an ossification of the institutions that make uh, uh, technological progress possible. Um, uh, the guild system, for instance, in the Netherlands in the second half of the 17th and early 18th century becomes increasingly conservative and resists the introduction of new technologies. Whereas a century earlier, they were the ones that adopted the new technologies. Mm -hmm. They now have a stake in preserving the technologies mm -hmm. that work. So when a new generation comes up, and people are saying, well, we would like to take this further, mm -hmm. they, run into, they run into resistance. And this kind of dynamism we see occurring here and there in other places as well. It's sort of, we already have the best technology. Mm -hmm. when we work hard to, 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 to innovate this. We fought an earlier generation. And we want, and now our technology is the status quo, and we don't want any young whippersnappers to try to dethrone mm -hmm. us. And particularly if you look, for instance, in the shipbuilding industry, by even as, as early as 1700, it is very, very 
uh, uh, codified in the sense that this is precisely how you build a ship, okay? And these are very good ships, but if you codify it too much, that means the deviations from that, further improvements, become increasingly difficult. In England, on the other hand, these guilds and these other uh, professional organizations that keep progress out are weak and remain weak. And that allows Britain to maintain a certain technological fluidity, which by 1700 is no longer there in the Netherlands. Uh, finally, of course, as I think Alan, Alan says is quite correctly, th their location isn't quite as good a, as England. And uh, in, in, in 1795, by the end of the 18th century, just when the Industrial Revolution in Britain can be said to be at, at, its, at its peak, they get invaded by France and for 20 years are dominated by the French who really um, uh, uh, exploit their country, tax it very heavily, uh, and of course because they're part of France they're at war with England and because England dominates the sea, almost all the Dutch activities that rely on the sea, which is a very large chunk of their economy, come to a standstill. And so in those 20 years the Dutch economy was set back many decades. And that sort of takes them out of the, out of the game until much later. What, what you see here, I mean, when Adam Smith, who was most fascinated by the Dutch case, he said that it had reached um, what you might call a kind of high-level equilibrium yes. by the time he was writing. It had risen, and then it had leveled off, as you say, from about 1650s, 1660s, and didn't seem to be going. It wasn't progressing. It wasn't going backwards, as he thought some of the European uh, Mediterranean powers were going, but it was... It wasn't going anywhere, and he explained it in some of the terms we've talked about, some of the ones that yeah. Maxine's talked about, the, the transfer of activity from production and uh, productive activity into banking, shipping, commercial activities. Now, he thought that it had leveled off like this. Um, turning from this case, which got very close and... Um, gave a lot to England and, and Britain uh, in its technologies. Much of our technologies were brought in from the Hol Holland and the Netherlands. Um, turn, let's turn to the other major case. Again, if you'd stood at the beginning of this period, if you'd stood in the 1620s, 1630s, and looked around the world, many people would have said, well, the place where there's really going to be an explosion, where the world, which is going to dominate the world, mm -hmm. is Islam. It's, it's not Europe at all. Here you have uh, powers which are militarily the equal of Europe, perhaps superior, who have inherited a great tradition of mathematics, science, knowledge, who are very well organized, uh, quite aggressive, and that's where the action is going to be. Now, it's a great puzzle as to why Islam, um, and the Ottoman Empire particularly at the end of the period, again reached some kind of high-level equilibrium and didn't overtake it. I'm not sure that we can pursue the question of very far. No. There's a very good example of this which is um, related to Hudson, which is in 1625 um, an Essex man born and bred called Samuel Purchase publishes four huge volumes in London, which are a history of the voyages of the English nation in a desperate effort to convince his countrymen that all major successful explorations have been made by Englishmen. That Purchase his pilgrims. In, exactly. Yes. And um, Samuel Purchase, who's a vicar, begins with a very long chapter on the problem of religion, because it's obvious to him and most of his readers that there's a very close relationship between the religious division of the world between Christianity and Islam and then inside Christianity between Protestantism and, and Catholicism and the capacity of Europe to expand by voyaging and trading and colonizing. And the first map which Purchase puts into his book is a Dutch map made by Henry Hondius which is a map of the world with Hudson's voyages and so on all marked. But the most important thing on Hondius's map is that it shows you symbolically which parts of the world are Christian and which parts are Muslim. And all the Christian bits are carefully marked with crosses and all the Muslim bits carefully marked with crescents. And Purchase is very, very worried because Islam, he knows from Dutch 
voyages down into West Africa and into the East is expanding into what is now the East Indies in <coughs> Indonesia during this period that is, Islam is very powerful indeed in West Africa which is one of the main Euro European sources of gold and that it looks to purchase sitting on the Essex shore of the Thames in the 1620s as if Islam is about to take over the whole planet and only Protestant England and the Netherlands will save Christendom and therefore as he understands it civilization from total e e eclipse so in 1625 it really looks as though yeah. Islam yeah. is the great world system yeah, well, it, it, and only trade and voyaging yeah. by these rather marginal islands off the coast of Europe can save us. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's certainly how it seemed to mm. contemporaries. Yeah. People at that time, I think, thought about the Ottoman Empire rather in the way that some Westerners thought um, of their most paranoiac about the Soviet Union as a possible threat. It was the great power mm -hmm. that was clearly wanted to take over the world and might well be able to do so mm -hmm. unless someone found some way of holding back this threat. Yes. But, but, but there are interesting sort of hints even at that time that if they had looked closer should have perhaps reassured them a little bit. One of them is, and I've always found this very telling about the asymmetry between European Christian civilization and uh, Middle Eastern Islamic civilization, and that is how much uh, Europeans actually knew about Islam. They are studying the language, they are studying the institutions, they are looking around seeing what do these people know that we don't know that we could possibly copy. And when, you know, the British uh, tourists in Constantinople, for instance, discover uh, the inoculation against yes. Walcott. They say, well, you know, this is not a bad idea. We could try yes. this as well. Lady what is Montague comes right. back with it. Right. Makes it fashionable. <laughs> yes. Now, what is interesting is that um, on, on, on most ma I I issues that matter, Islamic civilization doesn't return the favor. Mm -hmm. They do not study Christianities. They do not uh, uh, try to learn their languages. The only of the, of the Christian, quote, technologies that they uh, are willing to adopt, and even that they do quite willy-nilly, is firearms. Uh, it's quite amazing. It might also be pointed out that they're very slow, we talked earlier about, about information diffusion, they're very slow in adopting the printing press. Very right? Very very slow. Banned for some it was banned for, I think, the first book uh, printed in Arabic letters that, that is known of was printed in 1727. Now that, mind you, is more than two and a half centuries after the Gutenberg press, and there is no reason why Arabic uh, 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 letters can be because because it's, it's it's very much like Hebrew and Cyrillic and, and Cyrillic uh, uh, alphabet. I've heard people say that one of the problems is if you're considering, say, printing the Quran. Since this is the direct word of God, you absolutely must get it right. And the difficulty yeah. about Arabic script is that quite a lot of the meaning will depend on very small pointing. Yes, but that's true in, in, in Hebrew as well. Yes, yes, indeed. But uh, I don't books think books are printed in Hebrew right away. Uh, yes, indeed. On, but the difference is there that there are uh, not very many bits of a Hebrew Bible that are supposed to be directly uttered to mankind by the dear Himself. First five himself. books, the Pentateuch, surely <laughs> is. That's, that's written by Moses. <laughs> no, it's the direct word of God. And it says, she thou shalt not add, and why she thou shalt not subtract a word. I don't know whether Lots this is the right moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Islamic, the, um, Islamic it's the Islamic merchants. Absolutely, they yes. were the, you know, the um, great mm. merchants yes, of um, the very the medieval, early modern yes. period. Which, which the European, the, the Western Europeans knew very well indeed. Which is why yes. the Portuguese were so desperate to get ships round and into the Indian Ocean, which yes. they recognised as being the centre mm. of the world economy, linked to East and Asia, to and get, it was. And right. trying to, to wrest control from right. those Islamic merchants. What was it? Was it Vasco da Gama that sort of said when someone asked him what they'd come looking for? said, you know, spices and Christians. 
the hope was to find someone out there who might yes. enable them to get round the back yes. of the yeah. Ottoman Empire. Yeah. That's the Islamic uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, naval technology that was in some way inferior, maybe, or was overtaken by the West in terms of its sailing technologies. I think that you have to ask what jobs people wanted their ships to do. Um, the sort of trade that was taking place in the Indian Ocean was a seasonal trade in which people sailed largely one way out at one time of the year, did their jobs, sailed back at another time of the year. Dictated by the monsoons. Dictated by the monsoons. Mm. And their ships were admirably adapted to that. But I found on a trip I made to Lowestoft recently that the sort of sails that enable you to do that are not the sort of sails that will enable you to sail at will, say, out into the Atlantic and back again when you like. And that, I think, is a case where the sheer hardware of the technology that the Ottoman traders were using um, makes a crucial difference to their ability to compete with people with a more flexible naval technology, which the Portuguese developed. So, okay. Simon. A sort of virtuous feedback, so to speak, or a feedback loop begins to occur whereby as your technology, your naval technology improves, you explore around the globe. You take people who are interested in information on your ships or they bring back knowledge. You bring it back to Europe and it's digested and absorbed with great curiosity. One place where this obviously occurred was in Britain and in the Royal Society. What can you tell us about that sort of aspect of it? Yes, um, I mean, we've already talked about some of the aspects here. I think it's good to pull it together. Um, places separated by sea, it's easier to travel between them than places separated by land. Trade routes are wet. So boats and, above all, defensible, reliable cargo-carrying boats are what matters. Sailing a ship um, requires then not one single trick. There isn't going to be one innovation, one particular technique that will solve the problem of reliably sending boats from a home port to where you want to go and back again so, so, so that the ship takes as little time as possible and comes back through storm and flood and tempest. What you see instead is a whole set of techniques. So think of navigation as a system in which you have to have all the components aligned so that the whole navi navigation system works well. The Portuguese cracked this in the end of the 15th century. They had an entire navigation system, the regiment of the sea, which relied on two or three extremely good instruments, most of which they got from Islam and from Jewish navigators in the Mediterranean, a fantastically reliable system of mapping, good compasses, and a new kind of ship design, a new kind of hull with different kinds of sails, which gradually allow the Portuguese to build up a relatively secure, relatively robust navigation system. And when they get to where they want to, they are entering <coughs> the Indian Ocean world, which is, of course, already occupied by expert traders and navigators, mainly Muslim, who are not only uh, treated by the Portuguese as enemies, but, but above all as guides. We mustn't think of the Portuguese system as one which sort of enters the Indian Ocean and then survives on its own. That's not how international trade worked at that time. Shift focus to England, 17th century. The knowledge-making system of 17th century England has a very powerful ideological warrant laid down by Francis Bacon, the Lord Chancellor, in the 1610s and 20s. Many shall travel and knowledge will be increased. That's the slogan of his work. And on the frontispiece of Francis Bacon's great books on the improvement of the sciences, you see a picture of the Pillars of Hercules the straits between the Mediterranean and the, and the Atlantic, and you see ships sailing away 
from the known to the unknown world and then bringing back from the unknown world goods, commodities, facts, marvels, wonders, things of, as Bacon said, light and profit. So that's the ideological theme that's driving this. But there's also painfully and painstakingly constructed around new knowledge-making institutions like the Royal Society of London, which starts in 1660, navigational and, sci and scientific and, and astronomical systems, which make an enormous difference to the reliability of marine trade. You get a rise in the insurance system, which goes step by step with the increased reliability of English trading ships. And there are various elements to this system. Very interestingly, none of them, in fact, originally English. They're all taken from elsewhere and put together and carefully assembled. So think of what those things are. Compasses. You get increasingly reliable, increasingly accurate compasses. Fellows of the Royal Society experiment on those. Navigators improve magnetic design, compass design, compass st st stability. Fellows of the Royal Society win prizes for improving compass st stability. This gives you a sense of magnetic north. Magnetism becomes, in the 17th and 18th century, an English science. Edmund Halley, by 1700, 1710, is even able to make a map of the equal lines of magnetic deviation in the, in the, in the whole of the Atlantic, and then by 1720, the, the whole of the world. One, one of the first maps ever made, which has contours of a physical variable for, for the whole planet. So we can speak there, just thinking about compasses, of the birth of planetary consciousness. And it's clearly trade related. Then think about longitude, the great problem of navigation, knowing how far east or west you are from home. It's very, very difficult to even work out a method reliably to produce longitude, such that in 1714, Parliament offers a prize of enormous size for anyone who can get an accurate lo longitude method. And what makes longitude soluble and reliable, it seems to me, is that great 18th century principle, the division of labor. If you, if you look at the objects which eventually solve this problem, an object like this one, which is a marine chronometer made by John Arnold, one of the great clockmakers of late 18th century London, it's an object of wonder and beauty, clearly. This helps solve the problem of longitude because it allows people to know what their uh, local time is and what the time is whence they started. You are, as it were, carrying with you, as you voyage, time in London. Well, this is an assemblage of components drawn from different sources, from different experts. Different people had worked out that with a helical spring, you could get a re reliable clock movement. Um, Arnold himself had done experiment after experiment on the kinds of arrangements of metals which would make this system invulnerable to the huge temperature changes that you'd expect on a voyage. The escapement is kept separate from the clockwork. It's miniaturized. Previous attempts to build clocks like this had taken a, a long time, occupied a, a lot of space, and were very expensive. So expensive that sometimes only one of them was made. Arnold and his London clockmaker colleagues made hundreds of these so that every ship could be given a reliable and potentially identical chronometer. Similarly, if you look at the complementary instrument you, you need to navigate, something like a sextant, again, this is, this is not an original English de de device. It kind of comes from a long ancestry of divided circles that goes back to the Dutch and the Flemish and the it, it, Italians. But again, what the 18th century English can contribute is reliability and, to a large extent, automation. 
the making of dividing engines, which can divide circles reliably and equally to almost any degree of desired precision. And together, astronomical instruments and clocks and compasses provide a whole system which allows the English to send boats quickly by, by the shortest route, and reliably they will come back. And that makes, I think, world trade possible. Now, what's important for us about that system is that it also relies on responsive institutions in the metropolis, the Royal Observatory, um, the Navy Board, the Royal Society of London, are capable, it seems to me, of responding to promoting and sponsoring in a, in a, innovations like this. Because these are luxury goods. These are very pricey goods. Yet at the same time, partly through state sponsorship, but mainly through private initiatives like the East India Company, they are viable com commodities. It's worth the while of the instrument makers up and down Fleet Street and Ludgate Hill making lots of these because they have a market. Every East India ship, every merchantman will need one of these. So I think it's the combination of different elements very few of them original, put together in new ways and then made in a regular, regulated, reliable fashion. I mean, an Arnold cr cr chronometer, it seems to me, is just as important a consequence and also cause of the Industrial Revolution as a steam engine because of the world effects that these kinds of devices have and because of the production process which they embody. Fantastic, yes. I understand a great deal more. And the only thought that occurred to me is, is the consequences. I mean, it therefore seems no coincidence that Captain Cook, for instance, was able to uh, make his fantastic voyages into the Pacific. Um, he certainly couldn't have done that without what you've described. That's true, and one can add to that um, the fact that Cook's first boat, the Endeavour, is after all a Whitby collier. This Carried is, coal. Yeah, this isn't a boat designed to sail into the South Seas. This is a boat designed to carry the great English co commodity, coal, between Newcastle and the, and the Thames in winter. So relatively flat-bottomed, re extremely reliable, and Cook, who's a you know, Teesside man, knows how to sail a boat like that. When the Endeavour got wrecked on what is now the northeast coast of Australia in uh, his first voyage, and a huge spike of coral goes right through the hull, this could have finished not only that voyage, but Cook's whole crew. But instead, the Endeavour can be beached and fixed and then set sail again and safely re return to England. One shouldn't ignore the fact that just as when the Portuguese enter the Indian Ocean in the 1490s, what they encounter, and indeed what they expect to encounter, is a vast, extremely competent network of traders, pilots, and so forth, who are going to allow their uh, movement from the Cape of Good Hope towards India. Similarly, um, Cook and his immediate predecessors encounter Polynesian navigators who from a certain point of view are at least as impressive as the Europeans who managed to get their way to, to the South Seas. Um, Polynesian navigators were indispensable helps for a lot of the European voyages of the 18th century, after all, as guides and so on. But what's important is not, as it were, the heroic capacity of individuals like Cook and his men to get from London to Tahiti and back again with relatively few ca casualties and extraordinarily quickly. It's the capacity within <coughs> less than one <coughs> generation to turn Cook's voyage into an entirely new commercial network. It's the rapidity, if, if you like, of the period between 1769 and 1770 when James Cook arrives in the South Seas for the first time. And 1788, which is you know, less than three decades later, 
when the British establish an entirely new colony in Botany Bay with thousands of people, men and women and children and animals, with the presupposition that what Botany Bay will do is to allow a new British imperium in the whole of the Southern Pacific. And it more or less works for a time in massive competition with other European powers and, of course, with fatal effects on the, on the indigenous people which are with us to this day. But in the 30 years since the first moon landing, less has happened <laughs> in space travel than the 30 years between Cook on Tahiti in 1769 and Captain Philip in Botany Bay in 1788. And that's an extraordinary testimony to what the naval system allowed a European power, and especially in this case Britain, to do at immense range. I mean, and, and I think that contrast tells us something about the rate of change and about the success of the kinds of techniques that we've been thinking about. Mm, one, one has to say there, then, that uh, if one's trying to seek parallels for those great Chinese voyages of at least investigation, if not a discovery, in the 15th century, one does actually find them, not in the later voyages of people like Cook, who were going there, made out of this, but in fact in the American space program, which was not undertaken with the idea that there was going to be money made by going to the moon, but because it was a matter of national prestige that this project should be undertaken. I suspect that there is more of the, the lunar, pro the American moon landing program in Zheng He than there is of Captain Cook. I think that's a marvellous point. I mean, it does go back to what Maxime has been so importantly reminding us of, which is the very strong relationship in Western European culture in this period between profit, commodity, market, and wonder, right? I mean, in the case of the European voyages into the South Seas in the, in the 18th century, there's an extraordinarily intimate relationship between the value of wonder and the importance of the market. So, for example, Joseph Banks, who I think is at least as important as James Cook. He was, um, he was Cook's. the naturalist on mm -hmm. board the endeavour with Cook. He was a gentleman of, of leisure. Everyone with whom he could compare himself had been on the grand tour ar around Europe. So to trump them, and he says this ex ex explicitly, he went on the grand tour to Tahiti, where everyone else in his club had been on the grand tour to Naples. And what he paid for and brought back from the South Seas are treated like, and this is the great 18th century phrase, artificial curiosities. Such as oh my. Such as humans, yeah. Yes, the, um, the Polynesian yeah. who was brought back to Britain. And interestingly, when at last he was allowed to go home again, was kitted out with the whole paraphernalia of European society, mm. um, conveyed in terms of a whole mm. parade of things, European suits of armor mm. and um, pots and pans and bits of glass and ceramics and all sorts of, uh, gu a few guns, mm -hmm. all sorts of things, which he was supposed to go back to um, and receive immense admiration from his um, fellow countrymen mm -hmm. um, because of prestige these um, great European objects were meant to convey. But in fact, they had no impact at all, and he was completely ignored. <laughs> He'd lost his place in the society, and the, the stuff was just so much useless rubbish. Mm. And That's a sad story to end on, or a good story, maybe. <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, there's the, the exactly the same sort of thing happens in the McCartney ex, ex, em, Expedition. Em, ex, ex, Expedition. Embassy. Yes. Embassy, yes. sorry, Embassy, to yes. China immediately afterwards, right? Yes, these the Chinese certainly pretend very strongly that they're not interested in any of this stuff. Whether or not that's just a pose is a matter under some debate nowadays. Uh -huh. But they say, you know, you brought all these objects, they're just toys and, uh, you know, our system. That, that's what they said. Whereas yes, indeed, yes. Secretly we are, they were... They did maybe, keep them, though. They yes, were they kept did, in their they museums. Did. They did, they did. <laughs> what both elates and depresses me at the end of several searches for the causes of how the modern world occurred is that 
while the phenomenon seems so huge, self-evident around us, our explanations have not explained it. That's to say, firstly, many of them are quite small things that have happened in the past and which seem to have had dramatic effects. Secondly, each of those small things then requires an explanation in itself. We talked a good deal, for instance, about uh, nautical instruments and what really strikes one when one hears Simon talking about them is how fantastic they are, how much embedded information and knowledge and skill has gone into the making of uh, these instruments. Um, all sorts of traditions of mathematics and precise working has gone into one of these chronometers or um, devices for measuring. So where did it all that come from? I mean, this is already a, a fantastically advanced and system of knowledge and artefacts by 1600. So obviously we're going to have to go back and out to understand how that happened and why the, the sources that led to its events in Europe at that time. The other thing that strikes me is that all of these sorts of differences within Europe and the difference between Europe and Islam are very, very, very small. Just a wider river here, uh, a slightly thicker plank there, um, a slightly uh, more adventurous person there, and the whole thing could have gone a different way. It now seems so inevitable, here we are, and yet as you look backwards with our method, it all seems a giant heap of accidental chances which has led to where we are. And um, I don't know whether that's your impression as well, Simon. Yeah, I think that's right. People make history, but not in the circumstances of their own choosing, as a great economist once said. Um, and the problem for historians is to, is to get that balance right. We want in our stories to do justice to the extraordinary capacity of people to make their own history. Um, so we're going to be focusing, especially if what we're trying to explain is the emergence of the modern world out of traditional societies, um, we want to do justice to the extraordinary energy, innovative activity, creative ca capacity, and therefore, in a, in a certain sense, um, chanciness mm. of the way in which things go. That if such a person or such a factor had not been present, surely things would have gone in a, in a very different direction. But, uh, but on the other hand, given that, as you say, the phenomenon that we've got to explain is so present and so large scale, both in space and time, we want to do justice to the basic facts that are already present, the systems that are, that are already in place. Ex exactly as you say, because I'm so fascinated by the kinds of devices ingenious people make in order to make their way around the world and make a living out of it, um, one might think that these elegant and beautiful devices are testimony to human creativity and therefore the, the capacity of, of societies to move in any which way next time. Or one might be more impressed by all the knowledge, skill, work that's gone into these devices and therefore you're looking backwards all the time at what must already have been done for anyone now mm. to innovate mm. or live or trade or, mm. or survive. I'm not unhappy about the fact that we're still, to use the phrase, at sea a bit <laughs> in um, getting just the re re relationship between those two things right. But again, I think the answer is going to be pulling focus a bit more and we're starting to understand that the phenomenon, the riddle that, that we're interested in, is of such a scale that a few decades or even a few centuries is, is perhaps not just the right level to be thinking about. Thank you. Christopher, have you any thoughts I on was that? going to say, looking at your chronometer, something like that can give us just as easily two apparently quite opposite messages. Yeah. On the one hand, it can give us a message of how amazingly unexpected and creative people can be, uh, how, how they can do something totally new. On the other hand, when we see how much they have to do to get that thing right, mm -hmm. it looks like a terribly narrow sure. gap that they have to squeeze through to get somewhere else, yeah. something very limiting. So on the one hand, that's a tremendously expansive thing. On the other hand, it's something that ties people down perhaps to having to do some very particular things to get to somewhere new. Mm 
both at the same time. Yes, I think one of the implications of that is that part of this system that we're interested in that really matters for any story that we might want to tell each other is going to be something like feedback. That, that is to say, we want to try and find out what it is that makes very subtle changes, say, um, the capacity to make a balance that doesn't change its length when temperature changes, which doesn't sound like an earth-shattering technique, mm. that has multipliers. That means that that society was able to turn that very small but brilliant in a, innovation into something that had enormous effects globally. And it's what those little feedbacks, those, as you said earlier, virtuous circles are. Because if I, th and I think if we can get at that, then many of the problems of the riddles that we're posing ourselves will be at least a bit more tractable. I'm not sure that they'll be solved, but they'll, but they'll be easier to define. I think that, that last point, just before I uh, consult others, is terribly important. A friend of mine has likened development to a Meccano set. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have a certain basic size of Meccano set with lots of bits and pieces. These are the things you construct uh, models out of. You just add one extra piece to a, a fairly advanced Meccano set. And it doesn't allow you just to do one thing. Mm -hmm. Just put a wheel in there, yes. for instance. And you have an enormous multiplier effect, exponential, uh, a huge growth, because there are thousands of new things. So the introduction of one new thing, like the measurement of longitude mm -hmm. or whatever, suddenly, and that is why potentially human development can be so fast, mm -hmm. although very often it isn't. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important to emphasize. But, um, yeah. Joel? If I, if I may make two points. One of them is that, like everybody else, I cannot look at this chronometer and suppress a sense of admiration and almost wonderment, you know. How do we hit this thing? But it's important to keep in mind that we're looking at a winner here and that mm. for every successful chronometer mm. maker that we history records, there must have been scores, if not hundreds, of people who tried to make things that didn't quite work, or that worked but they weren't the first, or some other reason why they have uh, forgotten. There is a massive effort going on. And this is basically success by buckshot. We shoot, we try hundreds and hundreds of things, and then we pick the winners, and we pres and, and then we do the game over and over. We give them a prize. <laughs> we give them a prize sometimes. You know, in the case of Harrison, that surely is the case. There are a few cases in which people may come up with major breakthroughs, uh, 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 and weren't rewarded. But the other thing about this clock that strikes me, and here again, my instinct as an economist, probably uh, coming to the surface, is that this is something that can not only be made, but it can be made sufficiently cheaply and mm. in sufficient large numbers, yes. unlike, say, the yes. great Chinese clocks, mm. which were miracles mm. of ingenuity, but they just made one, mm. and then when it disappeared, too bad, it's gone. <laughs> this thing could be produced and reproduced. And the same, in, and this is seems, seems to be something mm. that the Europeans do continuously. Once they have a good idea that works, they are able to reproduce it. And the net result is massive economic impact, and not just entertainment or fun or wonderment, but actually uh, what ultimately leads to increases in what we would call the standard of living. And the standard of living in a wide sense, not just that people eat better, are better clothed, but also, for instance, that they have more choices to make. Right? Uh, economics is supposed to be uh, about how people make choices, and sociology is supposed to be about how they don't have any choices to make at all. But given what happens to nautical technology in the 17th and 18th century in Europe, there is a very fundamental choice that Europeans can make increasingly, and that is whether they want to live in Europe. And if they do not want to live in Europe, and, and, and a large number do not, of people do not want to live in Europe, they can pack up and go to what the mouth of the Hudson, yes. which eventually became New York. Okay, now there is people are in, in great uh, there are great debates among economic historians about who precisely were the people who packed up and left. Some people um, 
clearly were uh, looking for religious freedom, some people were looking for land, some people were just, you know, looking for uh, a peaceful life, running away from, from creditors, God knows what. But, but people start having their choice. In the Middle Ages, people essentially do not have that choice. Yeah. There are a few people who move around, but this is, this is a very rare phenomenon. By the time that, that 1830 comes around, this choice is becoming uh, an option for practically every European. And millions and millions of people choose to go. And even more people choose to stay. But this is a real choice. It is a choice that is made possible precisely by things like that, by better ships, better rigging, better sails, and so on.